24 verse 36 and our subject is don't be unprepared interesting how Yeshua is setting us up he first scares us to death and tells us don't be troubled <laughs> then he tells us the whole world's going to be deceived and tells us not to be and now the next thing he does is saying oh by the way you don't know when I'm coming so you better watch and be ready don't be unprepared so take your Bibles now, turn to Matthew 24, and we're at verse 36. Now in our last message, which will be tonight at 6.30, well, I should not tell you any advanced things. Don't miss it. And then following the service will be the rapture. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? And wouldn't you be upset if you missed it? Okay. All right. Verse 36. Follow along, please. Now, uh, I need to tell you, uh, several of you have said we appreciate your intellectual honesty because I give various views. I'm not trying to bash people or say I'm right and everybody else is wrong, but I do believe in careful exposition of Scripture. And I have taught uh, expository preaching for years uh, to pastors, hundreds of them, all over the world. And I'm telling you, that half of our problem is we read into the Bible our own opinions. So that's why I try to break it down, make it as easy for uh, you to understand as possible uh, without insulting you. Uh, but I believe in putting the cookies on the bottom shelf so all the kids can get them. Amen? Amen. We got a bunch of kids here who like cookies? Amen. Here we go. Verse 36. But... Boy, after saying all of that, now a little word of contrast. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as in the days as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. I'll explain that one. It definitely needs explanation, as you will soon see. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not. There are certain things you need to watch here carefully. One is who knows what. And watch the pronouns. Sometimes it's them and they. And then he says ye. He's talking to the disciples. They knew not all these people who lived in Noah's day. Until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken the other left. Those two verses are very controversial among Bible teachers. We'll try to look at it carefully. Verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye, change the pronoun, know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now he's going to give you two parables to illustrate this. One, know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So who then is a faithful and wise servant? He's going to talk about a wise servant and a wicked one whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat or food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil or wicked servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, he's going to abuse them, treat them wrong, to eat and drink with a drunk, and he's a drunk, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is a description of the final hell. We're not talking about something that's uh, just simply not doing his job. We're talking about severe 
consequences. Wow. Second parable. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. They are attendants at a wedding. Which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. This is a Jewish context. They're talking about the end of the betrothal period. When you have an engagement, when you announce the engagement, you always do it at the bridegroom's home. When the marriage is uh, finally consummated, it's always a marriage supper, usually a seven-day festival. Greatest food I've ever eaten. Anyway, uh, at a marriage supper or feast, uh, it's always at the bride's home. I was having a wedding at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and everybody was in the back in the lobby instead of coming in. And I didn't know what was going on. I was up front waiting for them to get the wedding going. And they were all laughing out there. I couldn't believe what it was. So I got off the platform, walked all the way back to the lobby, and uh, the father of the bride was passing out little cards. So I went and got one. And uh, now I know why they laughed. Here's what it says. I am the father of the bride. No one knows me, nor do they care anything about me. But I want you to know I paid for the whole thing. <laughs> so we're looking at the big wedding feast. And in ancient times, when the bridegroom, when you got the notice he's coming, all of the attendants would run down the road to meet him and welcome him to the marriage in a big entourage. By the way, you can read that same thing described in the Song of Solomon. Now we're told they took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. It's not really the normal time. The point of it is, nobody would expect him to come at midnight. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answer said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Here's the punchline. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would direct us so that we don't read into the Bible our own views. We don't turn to the right or the left, but we stick to what it says. Help us to understand the illustrations, the parables that are involved. Help us also, Lord, to know the seriousness of being ready. So many of us are consumed with everything in our lives that are like errands and jobs and business and money and all of this, and we've forgotten what you said about being ready. Help us, Lord, to understand, we pray. I pray for those in our audience who are not really sure of their relationship with you through your Son, our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord Yeshua. I pray that today might be life-changing for them. And it's in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Okay, we're going to go as slow as uh, we need to. And uh, hopefully I won't lose you in the shuffle. I need to tell you right up front, Bible teachers that you may have heard, whether radio, television, or in person, they disagree sharply over all the details I just read. And uh, that doesn't bother me. Uh, the Word of God is what's important. I want to understand it, and I want to take my time with it, and hopefully it will help you. 
All right? So let's start with the first thing our Lord told us in verse 36. And that's the impossibility of knowing when Yeshua will return. Well, don't you find that a little strange since we got all these preachers all over the world telling us when they think he's coming? Now there's a whole website, by the way, telling you there's no doubt about it. He's coming in 2012. And they've gone back to the Mayan civilization. And they're charting things out of the sky and they're absolutely sure. What did Yeshua say? You don't know. You don't know at all. Number two, let's look at the illustration of this. We're told it's the days of Noah. But right away, we have all kinds of arguments and disagreements about it. Now, I believe there was a global flood. I don't know. Do you believe that? You believe the whole world was inundated with water? I have a number of friends who uh, believe it's a local flood. And they're always disturbed when I announce, well, therefore, God is a liar. God said he would never destroy the world again with a flood like that. If it was a local flood, then God has been lying. You should also know that I spent a great deal of time debating on the University of California campuses about creation and the flood, especially the flood. They laugh at this. They don't believe it's a global flood. And it upsets their viewpoints about evolutionary thought. Evolution, in its final scientific basis, is based on paleontology. That's the structure of the Earth's surface. And almost everybody around the world believes that's the result of time, not catastrophe. I believe the opposite. I even experienced this myself. I was in the city of Yakima, Washington in 1980 in May when Mount St. Helens blew. I was preaching on earthquakes in Bible prophecy. <laughs> the people were panicking, they ran to the windows, they had no idea that explosion was huge. We went outside and already the ashes from Mount St. Helens was over a foot deep. We had to wade through it to even get to the cars and find somewhere to go. I since went, in fact it didn't take me long, I went right away to see what had happened. We had immediate stratification, like is all over the surface of the world. We had sedimentation there. We had also uh, petrified uh, rock and for forests. It was unbelievable. Well, what was that caused? By time? No, by a catastrophe. So we had living proof in Mount St. Helens. But God, when he wants us to know how serious the coming of the Lord is and being ready, he referred us back to the days of Noah. Now let me try to break this down a little bit for you. It definitely illustrates the patience of God. There had been no rain, there's not been a flood, and this man Noah is building a boat. A boat that's so big, the world never seen anything like it. He had no idea what he was doing, but uh, those who uh, know better about ships and oceans and floods Tell us that if you ever wanted one that would endure in the perfect storm, it would be Noah's Ark. It's perfect for it. Now, you should know this is no fairy tale. As a matter of fact, uh, work on uncovering and revealing to the world Noah's Ark is going on big time right now. Because one man, a name you should know, by every book he ever wrote. His name is Dr. Randall Price. Uh, he's an amazing person in that he's an evangelical pastor in his background. His doctoral dissertation was on the Jewish temple, but he also did archaeology. His uh, basic book, The Stones Cry Out, is a book worth buying. His book on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's the first non-Israeli to be over the Dead Sea Scrolls project. He's still on there. They're trying to find out from all the caves everything they can get out of there before the world makes them give that land up to their enemies. He also has been interested in the ark. He's the only person out of all the stories you've read of Noah's ark. He's the only one that the Turkish government is allowed to go up there. It's amazing. 
He has taken their soldiers, taking their guides, and he's going to leave everything he ever finds or discovers with the Turkish government. They bought into it. What he's found so far, Randall's a friend of mine. I'm going to be with him in a conference in Tempe, Arizona this next week. And what he has found is absolutely overwhelming. I know this is going to be a little disturbing, but there are two possible locations of the Ark and structures in those two that could very possibly be the Ark. One is in northern Iran. The other one's in northern Iraq. The Mount Ararat is a mountain range, very high. Goes up to 17,000 feet. Uh, when you get to 12,000 feet, you're above the tree line. So any man-made wooden structures above that are of extreme interest to us all. Uh, they have many satellite photos. Uh, he's been inside the glacier and seen a gigantic wooden structure. Described it. He plans to go back. The Turkish government has been very warm to him because not only is he a scholar of immense proportions in terms of background, but he is also very kind to the Muslim world. And so they're working with him. And he's also told them that he wants to put out a book well documented on the subject and give them credit for allowing him to do this. They loved it. So we got a real interesting situation happen. He says there's no doubt about it. We have a man-made structure about 2,000 feet in a glacier above the tree line. The same size in satellite photographs in that glacier, the same size as the one mentioned in the Bible. Well, that's only one thing. You tell me, how long did Noah work at building this big boat? There you go, 120 years. And I ask you, was God patient? Did you know that Peter writes in 2 Peter, Peter 3 that this patience of God in the days of Noah his long suffering is what brings us to the Lord aren't you glad God waited for you if you aren't truly a believer the Bible tells us the day of the Lord is coming but the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness that's meaning delay he's not delaying for any reason at all it says but he is long suffering Listen to this carefully, please. To us word. Doesn't say he's long-suffering to the whole world. It says to us. Talking about believers. Not willing that any should perish. Well, in the context, it's not willing that any of us should perish. But that all, meaning all of us, would come to repentance. The simple point is that God, being God, is going to accomplish his will and purpose. And everybody that he wants saved are going to get saved. You say, well, I got a family member, boy, he's so rebellious and all that. Listen, I got saved rebellious people all over the place in our Hope for Today ministry. We got ex-cons. I got an ex-mafia guy. Uh, we got drug addicts. We have women who are prostitutes. And it's amazing. God can take people and turn them around. We had a guy who was a drunk most of his life. And he uh, was giving his testimony and said he was a recovering alcoholic. I stopped him in the middle of his uh, talk. I said, you are either an alcoholic or you're not an alcoholic. Oh, no, he said, we're, we're recovering. We're taught to say that. Well, that's not in the Bible. The Bible says such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified. You're justified in the Lord Jesus. So stop saying that. Are you drinking now? No, I haven't since the day I got saved. Then you're no longer a drunk. He said, are you sure? <laughs> it's wonderful to talk about the patience of God, isn't it? And now how long have we been waiting since Jesus gave this? Over 1,900 years. And yet we read in Revelation, behold, I come quickly. And so skeptics use that and say, well, it wasn't too quick. And that's because they don't know Greek, and they don't know the meaning of takios, which is used in eight grammatical forms. It is not talking about coming today as opposed to a month later. No. 
The word that is used, I come quickly, is the word meaning sudden or surprise, or in its actual root, meaning no time to prepare. And that's the point behind our Lord's teaching us about what's coming in our immediate future. If you think you've got time to see some of this stuff and then, listen, God is already in his patience shown us many things that he didn't have to. Israel became a nation, 1948. He didn't have to do it then. Israel became an agricultural miracle, which he prophesied about. He didn't have to do it, but he did it. Uh, the Sinai Desert would produce flowers and fruit, and they would export it all over the world. That's already happened. Eighty percent of the fruit products of Europe come out of Israel. Israel will be a major financial power in the end time. How interesting, last week, the shekel in Israel, the number one currency now in the world, most stable. Under the leadership of the Minister of Finance, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who actually believes the Bible. He's the one who wrote a memo to U.S. President George Bush and said, don't you ever tell me what to do ever again. We're going to follow the Lord God of Israel. And it's just two weeks and we're going to have an election in Israel. And I'm praying that Netanyahu is going to be back in there. The best book on terrorism was written by him. He's a Harvard graduate. He loves evangelicals. And this man wants to follow God with all his heart. He's developing a possible cabinet right now, and he had one requirement. You have to believe in the Lord God of Israel and believe the Bible, every word of it. Or I don't want you in my cabinet. It's about time we had a change. We need that in our country, too. Not just put your hand on Lincoln's Bible. Read the thing. Amen? You know what else is illustrated? The problem of not being ready. See, look. I'm not trying to oversimplify to insult your intelligence, but I find in teaching this, because of its controversies and disagreements, we need to go carefully. It illustrates certainly the patience of God, but the problem of not being ready. Look at verse 39 again, chapter 24, 39. They knew not. Who didn't know? The flood victims. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I'll put that together for you in just a moment. Number three, here's a big controversy right here. We read that the days of Noah, verse 38, before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And there are many Bible teachers who say, well, that was life as normal, and that's why it was a big surprise. Nobody thought it would come. No, it's not. I'll prove it to you. What's being illustrated here is that the pattern of life that characterizes people at that time is totally violent, totally immoral, unbelievably so. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. What exactly was that culture like in the days of Noah? Because whatever it was, it's going to be repeated again before the Messiah returns. I'll leave you to judge whether or not we're in that already. Chapter 6, verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Stop right there. How many people were on the planet when the flood came? Big, big, big argument. I've debated this on university campuses. I know about the arguments. Let me just tell you. In the genealogy of Genesis 5, the average age is 905 years. Under every generation, you know the year they first had their first child. And we are told in the Bible they had sons, plural, and daughters, plural. So let's use the basic four, although there was probably a lot more. Because after all, what do you do for 900 years? Amen? Okay. <laughs> All right, there are no malls, so think about it. Anyway, <laughs> let's start with four, and let's have every generation. Now we've got to know how uh, long was it from Adam until the flood. And that's easy to figure out. It's 1,656 years. And that was the day, the year, that Methuselah died. 
We should have known that because Enoch was a preacher of prophecy, his dad. And he was taken to heaven, interestingly. But he named his boy Methuselah. The Methu part is the word for kill or die when he dies. And the Selah, which you see often in the Psalms and all, means it's done, it's finished. When he dies, it will come and it'll be finished. It'll be exactly what the prophecy was, which was what? A flood. So when Methuselah died, it's the exact same year of the flood. 1,656 years. Take every generation, give them four kids, and how many do you have? After 1,656 years, you have close to 15 billion people on the planet. Twice what we have now. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Wow. Wow. That's lots of people. Is there any proof that millions and millions of people died in a catastrophe like the Bible describes? Why, sure there is. In all the debates with evolution, you probably know if you've ever been exposed to it, that the scientific basis of evolution is what we call paleontology or the structure of the Earth's surface. All of this strata, they believe, is a result of time all the way down to the Cambrian and even pre-Cambrian zones of one-celled creatures. Now, if you ask any evolution, no matter who they are, uh, you know you guys are after the bones to prove about all these animals and people. Uh, where are the human bones located? Well, they'll tell you. There are millions of them. They're all over the world. They're at the top strata. Really? What caught? Well, that's just time. Well, if it's time, and you guys said all these zones are time, then how did they get pushed up to the top? You see, in the Bible, it tells us that the flood did not result from rain. It only rained 40 days and 40 nights. That's just enough to drive people wild who live in Hawaii. <laughs> no, what caused it? We are told the great fountains of the deep were broken up. There was volcanic eruptions in the oceanic caverns. There's plenty of water in all these oceanic caverns to cover the world several times around. We saw the tsunami, so we know how it happens. And when those earthquakes happen in the bottom of the ocean, great volumes of water go over the surface of the water, surface of the land, and then they recede. Now I ask you a question. According to the Bible, how long did this go on? And the Bible tells you. For five months. On a lunar calendar, that's 150 days. 150 days of volcanic eruption, great volumes of water going over, then receding. I have asked scientists who don't believe this. I said, if that really happened, what would be the result? They all answered the same. Well, immediate sedimentation, fossilization, and strata, of course. But they don't believe it happened. I said, well, you believe in time, but you haven't explained to me why we have large animals and human beings at the top and not at the bottom. They said, well, that's a result of evolution. Really? Do you understand? I know by personal experience, probably more than any of you here, unless you've actually been involved with these kind of debates on a university basis, I know more than any of you about Peter's remark in 2 Peter 3, they are willfully ignorant. It isn't just not knowing, they are rebellious in the matter. They don't want to admit the obvious. Of course, if this volcanic eruptions were happening for 150 days, uh, large animals and humans would be fleeing to higher ground. That's why we have millions of human bones in that strata. Well, where, how did this happen? And to say it happened in time blows the theory of stratification being the result of millions of years. It's unbelievable. People don't want to face it. Uh, they have such stupid arguments, like comparative anatomy. Uh, you look at a monkey and uh, in the womb, the fetus is similar to an animal. Uh, that's supposed to prove evolution? For the same reason, I can tell you that a Cadillac evolved from a Volkswagen. They have four wheels, steering wheel, run on gas. 
No, comparative anatomy, anatomy just proves that the creator of all understood the needs of both. There are unbelievable differences, as you well know. It, it's just amazing to me. They just keep going on, willfully denying it. They don't even want to look at what was going on on planet Earth before the flood came. What was going on? I started with men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Genesis chapter 6. Let's keep reading. You got your Bible open? I'm opening mine. I lost my place. Chapter 6. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God. Sounds like Christians, believers. No, no, no. Sons of God in the Old Testament are angels. They can either be good or bad. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. You read that in English, you think on a scale of 1 to 10, they're not exactly beauties, or by maybe a 2 or a 3. No, no, no. The word fair means gorgeous, beautiful. Not what you think it does in English. We have a city in Israel named after that word, Haifa, a beautiful harbor. They saw they were beautiful, and they, watch this, took them wives of all which they chose. Does it say, please, read your Bible carefully, does it say they took women? No, it says wives. Does it say they took virgins to marry them? No. It's wives. So all of those Bible prophecy teachers have been telling you life was as normal and that's what it means. No, it doesn't. No, you're talking about abusive. You're talking about sexual domination. The immorality was unbelievable. God says he won't always strive with flesh because of it. Uh, look at verse 5. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look down at verse 11. The earth was also corrupt, morally corrupt before God, and it was filled with violence. All flesh had corrupted its way on the earth, verse 12. And God said, The end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence, and behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. Listen, friends, what we have here in Genesis 6 are four clear signs of what it will be like when the Son of Man comes. One, there's going to be population explosion when men began to multiply in the face of the earth. Number two, there will be moral deterioration, which is exactly what's happening. You've got rape, uh, you've got adultery, it's, it, the world is crazy. Number three, you've got widespread violence. That's what we have all over the world. Uh, the worst violence ever in the history of mankind occurred in the 20th century. More people were killed by violent acts than any other way. Demonic infiltration. The sons of God are mentioned in Jude 6 and 7. And it says they are the angels that kept not their first estate, but fell into sin and went after strange flesh, heteros, not their own substance, but they inhabited unbelieving men and they went bonkers on sexual perversion. There's a compound word of sexual perversion used in Jude 7 to let us know this was a generation that needed to be wiped out by God. I ask you humbly and sincerely and with as much intelligence as we all can muster, is our world parallel today to what happened in the days of Noah? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But there's something else that's illustrated here. Not only the patience of God and the problem of not being ready and the practices of a lifestyle that was far from God, but it illustrated the principle of faith. Listen to me, people. When you look at that whole situation, he didn't have a Bible. He didn't have one book of the Bible. And the Bible tells you in Hebrews 11 that Noah simply believed the audible voice of God that there was going to be a flood that he never even saw rain, let alone a flood. Builds it for 120 years while a generation mocks and laughs at him. And the Bible says he was warned by God and he believed it. The same passage in Hebrews 11 says that it is by faith that we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God 
so that the things that we see were not made of any things that appear. They come out of nothing. When the Bible says in the beginning God created, it's the Hebrew word bara. Out of nothing, God created the universe. Amazing. It illustrates the principle of faith. I ask you, what do you believe? you got more evidence about the future and about everything God said than Noah ever had. And what do you believe? Do you believe that when Jesus told us this, it's the truth? Do you believe that Jesus really is coming? Do you really? Yeah. Is it making any difference in the way you live and your lifestyle? It should. Let's keep going. Here's the tough part. We have to inter... What time is this thing in? I got it kind of late, about eight minutes late. Man. Can you give me 15? Amen? Okay? Amen. I know it's serious. I can always tell because I get very, very hungry at the last service. <laughs> That's usually why I cut it off. Uh, it would be absolutely unfortunate if I don't tell you this. So give me 15. First, we have a definite disagreement among many of these guys are my friends. I love them dearly. The interpretation of those who are taken and those who are left. Let's look at it again, verse 40 and 41. Matthew 24. Lost my place again. Here we go. Verse 40 and 41. It says, Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Now, here's the problem. First of all, we need to understand the people that are involved. The first time we read, took them all away, verse 39, those are all unbelievers who died in the flood. Everybody understanding? But now who is taken? That's the question. And I'll tell you why it's a problem. The flood victims were non-believers who did not know that it was coming. Noah and his family represent tribulation believers who do know the day. Noah knew the day. God told him what it was. How will tribulation believers know the day when they get into the tribulation? Easy. If you're following this whole story about Jesus, what he said, what's the main event that causes them to know the timing of the tribulation? Answer, when the abomination of desolation, who is the Antichrist, when he goes into a rebuilt Jewish temple that he himself made possible by a peace agreement, he will go in there and demand the Jews worship him. Then they are going to flee. Then it will be exactly 42 months. It will be exactly 1,260 days. And Jesus will return at the end. Wow. So the tribulation believers know the day. Now when he turned and talked to the disciples, what did he indicate? Well, they have to be church age believers, obviously who do not know the day. So this is common in Jewish teaching, but not common to Gentiles. It is teaching by contrast in the whole avenue of comparison. Parables are comparisons, aren't they? Just a simple truth of everyday life and then applied to something spiritually. But Jews can teach by contrast. That's why we get all upset when we read about he who hates his brother you know, he's an unbeliever. He who loves his brother is a believer. Like in 1 John, we, well, how much hate? You know, how much love? You know, we, we as English-speaking people are making a big case over English words and not understanding how Jews teach. Jews teach by exaggeration. And some of us think it's lying. No, it's not. It's exaggeration for effect. For an example... It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And we got all kinds of pastors who say there was a little door in the gate into Jerusalem and it would be tough, but you'd have to cram a camel through there. There was no such door like that. 
He's talking about the eye of a weaver's needle. In other words, totally impossible exaggeration for effect. They do it all the time. Here it's by contrast. Church age believers have something in common with flood victims. Neither one of us knew the day. Everybody following? Please, be careful. Well, we got the usage of words as a problem as well. In verse 39, when it says he took them all away, the flood victims, it's a Greek word, ireto, which means to take in judgment. And we understand that, because they all died in the flood. But when he came down to verse 40 and 41, one shall be taken, the other left, he changed the word. Now, the Holy Spirit is the true author of the Bible. The question is, why change the word? Now it's para lambano. Lambano is still used today by Greek-speaking people. It means to receive. It's a word of comfort. In John 14, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. Para lambano. It's a word of comfort, not judgment. So I ask you, if that's true, and it is, then who are the ones who are taken and who are the ones that are left? We have many teachers who say, the ones that are taken are those taken in judgment. And they would see that through the tribulation. And then they, the ones who are left are left to go into the millennial kingdom of our Lord. Well, why would the Holy Spirit change the words? so dramatic of a difference. I say to you, it's very possible that the ones who are taken are like Noah and his family who are taken into the ark, a word of comfort. And the ones who are left are the ones left to experience the horrors of the day of the Lord, the tribulation period, which is the illustration or is illustrated by the flood. Is everybody understanding now? If you're not, I don't know what to tell you. Get the tape. Now, the big question I need to tell you, Bible teachers disagree over this. Uh, I taught Greek for nine years and studied over nine years in Greek, so, you know, I'm, Greek is more than a delicatessen to Sir Baklava, to me. Okay, all right? Now, so the question is, are these words interchangeable? That's what a lot of people say. Or is there grammatical significance to their differences? My answer to that is that I don't believe the Holy Spirit is trying to trick us. I do not believe that. And that is a big, giant, grammatical trick if you think they're interchangeable. Because they're totally opposite. One is a word of judgment, the other is a word of comfort. So the one taken in judgment and the other left would be to go in the millennium or... The one taken is taken into the ark like Noah and the family and one left to experience the judgment of the tribulation which is symbolized by the flood. Everybody understanding now? You say, which one is correct? I think I've already told you where I lean. It's like the guy who had two wives, Tilly and Millie, and uh, when he died, they were both died before him and they were buried and he had his burial plot right between the two of them and he said, uh, i tell you, uh, I want the distance between Tilly and Millie to be the same, so everybody will know I treated them the same. But if you could, tip me towards Tilly. <laughs> so uh, what I'm trying to say, if you want to tip me, I'm going to be tipped towards the rapture of the church, which is illustrated by Noah and his family going into the ark. Amen? Eight souls, Peter said, were saved through that water of judgment. Praise the Lord. But the imperative for the disciples, so let's act like we're there, because they represent church-age people, so we're sitting there hearing our Lord tell us this. And what is the punchline? Watch and be ready. Does it mean to go out in the morning and look at the sky and see if he's there yet? No, it does not. The word watch is a word dealing with your lifestyle. Watch means to watch how you live. It is talking about walking with the Lord. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, 
we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in him will purify himself, even as he is pure. I know that the prophecies of the Bible in the second coming of Jesus are not being taught in the churches as they should be. Why? Because we see so-called Christian people living like the devil through the week. Be careful, my friends. Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in that day, haven't we done many wonderful works? And I'll turn to them and say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Not you knew it once and you lost it. You never had it at all. And many people convince themselves they're in the in group, but they've never been born again. And yet in their hearts, when they're all alone, in the deep recesses of their mind, they begin to wonder about their relationship to God. And it's time now for brutal honesty. Not that we're on some guilt trip or not trying to scare you out of your conversion. That isn't the point. But because of what Jesus said, the seriousness of it all is we need to stop messing around and playing church and settle our relationship with God before it's too late. Amen? Amen. The reason you don't know the hour when he's going to come. Now, I need to leave you with the two parables. Two parables that illustrate what he's saying. The one is a parable of the servants. Servants that are to serve the Lord of the household. Some are wise, and they will be rewarded by God. And some are wicked, and the result is hell. Wow. Not just loss of reward. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's unbelievable. Once again, the parable emphasizes the seriousness of what our Lord is teaching about being prepared. The second parable are the virgins. And everybody gets mixed up on this. Well, that must be the church. No. This isn't the bride. These are the attendants of the wedding. And we're told that five of these wise attendants uh, took oil in their lamps and they were ready to receive the bridegroom. That would have to be tribulation believers, obviously. And we have five foolish virgins that took no oil in their lamps and they would be tribulation non-believers who are going to face the judgment of God. The bridegroom is obviously our Lord Yeshua himself. Well, then the bride is who? That should be obvious by who he directed and changed the pronouns to. Ye, ye, ye. The disciples representing church age believers. We are the bride. The Bible says so. We're going to be introduced at the wedding. Well, when is the wedding? Here's another point of confusion. Bible teachers say, well, that'll be in heaven during the tribulation on earth. No, it won't. Why? Because we're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're not resurrected until the end of the tribulation. And all the tribulation believers who died for their faith are also going to be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. Now, if you know a Jewish wedding, it, it clears it all up. When you get engaged, you go to the bridegroom's home. Where's our bridegroom's home? Heaven. You go there when you announce the engagement. Usually it's a year or longer of engagement among Jewish uh, people about to be married. At the end, the culmination of the marriage is when you have the big marriage supper. In ancient times, it was always a minimum of seven days. Lots of food, lots of, even today. I've done many of these, and I can tell you, uh, Jews eat a lot better than Gentiles. Their food is remarkable. Amen? You want a couple of tips? Always go to the Feast of Tabernacles. Get your Jewish friends to invite you. It's the greatest food you've ever eaten in your life. And then number two, always go to a Jewish wedding. Amen? Yeah, I'm just planning not to eat that day and go. I mean, you won't believe what's available. <laughs> Italians, you know, they, they go to a wedding or a funeral once a month, whether they know the people or not. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
So when is the marriage supper? At the end, on the earth, which will be the new kingdom of our Lord. It will be introduced by the marriage supper as the bridegroom will introduce his bride to the world. Wow. I intend to be there. Do you? Wow. The importance of the event is what? To meet the bridegroom. Wow. And the issue deals with being ready. Verse 10 of chapter 25 says, They that were ready. But the five foolish virgins were not. And so the impact on those who are not ready is in verse 12. I know you not. Wow. I hope that this little study has made it very clear to you that our Lord wants every person here to watch and be ready because you don't know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. Amen? Amen. Will you join me please in prayer and thank you for your patience. Father, we thank you for the Word of God that lives and abides forever. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us again that we need to be prepared and ready. Lord, I don't know the hearts of these people, but you do. And it's so easy for us, encumbered about everything in life, all kinds of errands and duties and jobs and finances and families. It's so easy for us to ignore you, Lord. We don't mean to, but it winds up that way. And God, I would pray that you would bring a holy seriousness into all of us. It appears from what our human discernment can possibly muster, it appears that we're on the threshold of the return of the Messiah. And Lord, I pray that everyone here would be those that were taken into the ark and not left to experience the horrors of a worldwide flood or a tribulation that is coming. And Lord, when we're not real sure, help us to be honest and open with you and to say, Lord, I'm not sure. I need to settle this. With your heads bowed and eyes closed as I interrupt my prayer for a moment, please don't look around. Maintain privacy for everybody. And though no one on either side of you knows what you're doing, you do, God does. And if you know there's something wrong, you're not clear about your relationship to the Lord. I'm going to ask you right now to call upon God, right where you're sitting, and to seal that moment in your own heart. Just lift your hand up to the Lord. At the same time in your heart, say, God, please help me. i got to settle this. Yes, God bless you. Right where you are. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I need to settle this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Way in the back over here. It's not important I see. It's important you do it. Things are not clear in your mind and heart. Don't go on anymore. Let's get it straightened out. Father, I want to thank you that you're a God of mercy and love and grace and forgiveness and so many of us have blown it Lord we've made a mess of things but there you are you have never left us or forsaken us you told us that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord God help these folks to settle the relation to get to a Bible as soon as they can and find out what it is we're to know and believe and do and there would be no doubts anymore they would know that they are born again of the spirit of God we thank you in the blessed name of our Messiah our Lord Yeshua we pray amen let's stand as we sing our closing song and if you would like some help we have some packets so right over here to my left on this front row and after we're dismissed we're not trying to embarrass any of you but if you want some help We've prepared these for you. Just drift on up and grab one and take it home with you. Uh, we want you to understand the seriousness of what we've been talking about. Tonight, the final message, and then the rapture. Well, that's true one way or another, isn't it? Okay.
Praise the Lord. Let's sing unto the Lord. Yeah. 